All right, Village family, would you open up your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis? Some folks are coming around right now. They'd love to hand you a Bible. Just raise your hand if you need one. They'll hand you one. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 6. Well, today we are going to enter into one of the most iconic, one of the most well-known accounts in the book of Genesis. In fact, we could probably say one of the most well-known accounts in all of the Bible. You don't have to have ever walked inside a church. You don't have to have ever opened up a Bible, and you probably know the story of Noah, at least to some degree. If we just went out there and we just, we just kind of went to a busy street and we just started asking people questions and, and we said, tell us what you know about Noah from the Bible, I imagine people would say either one of two things. They would either say the ark or they would say the flood. When we think of Noah, that, that is what he is uh, most known for, the man who built the ark and the man who survived a flood. But today, I want us to leave here thinking about Noah differently. You know, when we think about Noah, I want us to think beyond that Sunday school image of this old man in a brown robe with this big white beard standing on this boat with all these animals around him. I want us to think about a man who had an unshakable faith in a wicked generation. I want us to think about a man who stood alone when everyone else had abandoned God and was boldly proclaiming the truth of God. When we take a true examination of the person of Noah, I think we find a life that challenges us. I think we find a life that convicts us. I think we find a life that inspires us. I think we find a life that spurs us on to be people who are bold, to be people who are faithful, to be people who are obedient. Our passage today is going to cover Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 through 22. But really this morning, I want us to focus on just a few verses Typically, we'd open up to a passage and we'd walk through that passage, typically verse by verse. But but this moment, I or this morning, I simply want us to focus on a couple verses that help us understand who Noah was. A couple verses that help us understand his faith. In fact, as we read this passage, I believe that there is one verse that defines for us who he was. And so as I read this passage, I want you to be thinking about what that one verse is. Does that one verse jump out to you? And so I'm going to read Genesis chapter 6. Just for the sake of context, I'm going to move back to verse 5. I'm going to read to the end of this chapter. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creepy things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9 continues, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 550 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. 
Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and the animals according to their kinds, of every creepy thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive." Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve, serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. I know there's a lot going on in that passage. It's a long passage. But did the singular verse that I think defines who Noah was, did it stand out to you? Well, the verse for me was the very last verse, verse 22. God has just told Noah to do something that is unbelievable. I mean, this is not your ordinary, everyday commander call of God. God has just said to Noah, I'm going to destroy every living thing. I think that's the point for Noah that he might have thought, you know what, <laughs> I'm wondering if this is a God that I can truly follow. And not only that, but, but he says, I'm going to destroy everything by flooding the earth. At this point, no, no one had ever experienced a flood. No one has never watched news footage of a city that was flooding or a region that was experiencing devastating flooding. He had no filter, no connection, no understanding, no context for this. And, and then his instructions from God kept getting stranger and stranger. God tells Noah, I want you to build a boat. A boat in which you're going to fill it with lots of animals for you and your wife and your sons and their wives. And this is a task that's not just going to take you a week or a month or a year. It's going to take you years and years and years and years. Noah, this is going to be a time commitment. This is going to be a financial commitment. Noah knew that this command was not going to win him friends. In fact, he knew this would probably be a command if he chose to do it. He would be laughed at. He would be mocked. He would be ridiculed. He would probably be broke and poor by the time this thing was finished. And I imagine some of the doubts, some of the questions weren't, wouldn't just come from the outside people, but some would be coming from his own family, maybe from his own wife, with good intentions. We'd be asking the questions... Okay, are you sure this is what he said to you? I mean, are you sure you heard him correctly? We wouldn't blame Noah if his response was, I, I don't know, God. I'm not so sure about this. In fact, I'm uncomfortable with this. In fact, I, I think I may not be your guy for this. God just gives Noah an incredibly unbelievably, unbelievable, the difficult, a challenging command. And we come to verse 22, and it said, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And we ask the question, how does Noah have that kind of response? How does Noah have that kind of faith in which he simply says, okay, okay, I'll do it. Well, I think verse 9 in Genesis chapter 6 gives us some insight into why Noah responds the way he does in verse 20, 22, because Noah gives, or verse, verse 9 gives us a picture of who Noah was. But before we look at verse 9, I want us to go back to the previous verse that we ended with last week where we are introduced to Noah. Chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 tells us that the world is wicked and that God was going to wipe out all living things. And, and then Moses writes these words in verse 8. 
but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I think sometimes when we come to verse 8, this is how we read it. God saw that the world was wicked, but he saw one person that was good. I think that's typically how we can read verse 8. God's looking at everything that is bad, but he goes, but, but there's Noah. But when, when, when Moses gives us verse 9, his intention isn't that we focus on the goodness of Noah. God didn't choose Noah here in verse 8 because he was a good man. He chose Noah because God is gracious. Moses is about to take us into a passage in which we're going to talk about the faith and the character and the obedience of Noah, a passage that lifts up this man as an example for us to follow. But before Noah gets there, he wants us to know one thing. This story isn't about the goodness of Noah. It is about the grace of God. Noah was still a sinner, and his sin still deserved death. It doesn't say Noah earned the right to be used by God. It says Noah found favor. That word favor means grace. In other words, by the grace of God, God used Noah. But what we're going to see in the rest of this passage is how Noah responded to who God was. What we're going to see in Noah that is an example for us is how Noah responds to a God of love and mercy and grace. Verse 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah responds to who God is by living right before God, by living blameless before God. Verse 9 is an intriguing and interesting and important verse for us because this is the first time in Scripture that we see the words righteous and blameless. Now, the idea of one being righteous here in this context, in, 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 in describing Noah, is that Noah did what was right before God. He lived according to the truth of God. What God had communi communicated to humanity up to this point in history about how God wanted humanity to live before him, that is how Noah lived. In other words, Noah was a man who was obedient. It's the first thing we learn about Noah. The second thing that we learn about him is that Scripture calls him blameless. Now, it doesn't mean that he was sinless. What Scripture is saying, that when, when it calls him blameless, he says Noah was a man of integrity. His, his private life matched his public life. His, his words matched his action. But here's what's interesting in how Noah is described in verse 9. That his right living, his obedience, his integrity were on public display. One commentator observed that the phrase blameless in his generation means that Noah's contemporaries viewed him that way. That he didn't just have integrity before God. He had integrity before others, that his righteousness and his integrity weren't being lived out in solitude. He had a reputation. He had a life that was being lived publicly for people to see. What makes this so intriguing is how the Bible describes the other people that were around him, the other people that were viewing his life. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, the world looked at Noah's life, and they probably thought he lived a strange life, a peculiar life. They may have found him to be weird, odd, crazy, strange. 
they also know this was a man of integrity. They may say, you know, I don't really get his worldview. I don't really get his religion. But I'll tell you one thing about Noah. That's someone who's honest. That's someone that we can trust. I'll tell you one thing. In my dealings with Noah, his yes is a yes and his no is a no. He, that, that's not a man who's going to cheat us or lie to us or take advantage of us. Isn't it interesting in the midst of wickedness that people recognize integrity? I think we, we, we still see that in our culture today. That the, even in the midst of a culture that is wicked, people still recognize when people are honest and truthful and live with integrity. Why? Because it's how they want to be treated. Right? I mean, there may be people who they are dishonest in their dealings with others, but how do they want to be treated? They want people to treat them honestly. There may be people who they, their natural bent is to be unfaithful. But what are they looking for in relationships in their life? They want people to be faithful to them. There may be people, and, 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 and people have wronged them, and they will not forgive that other person. But when they've made a mistake, or they've wronged someone, what are they hoping for? They're hoping for forgiveness. You know, biblical values may not be the values that people in the godless culture want to live out. But they're certainly the culture, they're certainly the values that they want to receive. That, that even in a culture that is ungodly, living out godly characteristics makes an impact. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12 writes, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. P Peter's saying is that when we live right before God, in a godless world, people will see the character of God. That our obedience before God in the world that does not know God is a testimony of the reality and the truth of God. Because people are watching. People are watching Noah. And he was probably an easy person to notice because he lived differently Imagine being the only person or one of the very few people in the entire world that was seeking after the heart of God. You would be noticed. But here's what I find challenging and convicting about the life of Noah is that even though he lived differently, he didn't live apart. He didn't live separate from the world. I think sometimes we kind of create in our minds our own image of who Noah was. And I think sometimes we have this image of Noah as one who did live apart from the rest of the world. They had no association with it. I don't know about you, but I think that's sometimes the picture I can have in, in my own mind. And the other picture I think sometimes we have of Noah is, is, a, ma is a man who was a man of few words. That maybe he was a man who was quiet because we don't really hear or see Noah speak in this whole account until we get to the very end of chapter 9. So sometimes we create this picture of a man who lived apart from the world, living out uh, his, 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 his faith, in just a, or just kind of living out a quiet, private faith before God. I think for some of us, that, that, that may seem like the ideal life. I just live separate from the wickedness of the world, and I just have this quiet, private relationship with God. And yet, 2 Peter 2.5 describes Noah not as a silent man living in isolation, but rather, as Peter calls him, a herald of righteousness. Your translation may say he was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was publicly proclaiming the word of God. 
that he was entering into his wicked generation and he was declaring to them how to live rightly before God and by preaching righteousness into a wicked culture, what was he doing? He's calling out the way they're living. He's condemning their wickedness. And so not only is he a man standing alone, he's not hiding, but he is standing alone publicly, declaring the truth of God. How do you think that lone voice was received in a wicked generation? Well, the scripture tells us the only people who got on the ark were he, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Uh, apparently, his message was not received by his generation. Apparently, he wasn't a popular preacher with a huge following. He wasn't a preacher of righteousness because it brought him influence and wealth and adoring supporters. In fact, what it probably brought him was death threats. And the reason I say that is because the world Noah was living in was a violent world. Scripture says, L listen to what... <coughs> Verses 11 and 13 say about the world that Noah was living in. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And then verse 13 said, And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence. There's a lot of ways to describe wickedness. There's a lot of ways to, to describe immorality. But, but, but when, when Scripture speaks about this time that Noah was alive, it uses two words to give us an emphasis about what the world was like. It was a violent world. There was no moral law that people lived under. There was no civil, civic law or civil law that people were living under. People did what was right in their own eyes. It was sin, unchained, unhindered, running free. That's a world you want to run from, right? I and mean, that's a world you want to hide from. That's a world you want to retreat from. That, that, that's a world that you might have good reason to say, you know what, when I have to do business with the world, I'm probably just going to keep my own beliefs, my own worldviews to myself. Hey, if I want to protect my own life, if I want to protect the life of my wife, if I want to protect the life of my family, I just need to kind of live a private, quiet life and no one gets hurt. And yet it is in the middle of this hostility. It is in the middle of this violent culture that scripture describes Noah as a herald, as a preacher, as a proclaimer of the righteousness of the one true God. If you stood alone in your faith, let's say somehow you found yourself, you and your family, and you were the last surviving Christians. And the world had become dark like we've never imagined it. And it was just wicked and violent. Do you think your natural instinct would be to go and to publicly proclaim the truth of God? You know, I think it's easy to think that the most difficult thing that, Mo, that Noah did in his life was build an ark and have his reputation tainted. I think sometimes we think the most difficult thing that Noah did in his life is to build this crazy structure where there was no water and people just think you're crazy. You know, I think the most difficult thing that Noah did is he walked into a generation that was wicked with no other support, no other Christians around him, and speak of the one true God. And preach of the righteousness of God in a world that had abandoned God. See, it's one thing to walk into a situation in which your reputation will be harmed. It's another thing to put yourself in a situation in which you know your life will most likely be taken. May we not remember Noah simply as a builder of an ark, but a man who boldly proclaimed the righteousness of God in a wicked and depraved generation. 
I think there's great challenge there for us. I think there's a life there that spurs us on in the current culture that you and I live in. And so we have to ask the question, where does this come from in Noah? I mean, I mean, why does a man choose to live like this? It would be so easy for Noah to retreat, to hide, to give up, to give in, to compromise, to simply conform to the ways of his generation everyone else had. Well, I believe Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a glimpse into why he did the things that he did. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Verse 7 says he built this ark out of faith. This is, this is he, he went and by faith, God, I, I don't know if I have the energy for this. I don't know if I have the time for this. I don't know if I have the resources for this. I don't know what it looks like for me to build this ark. But by faith, he built the ark. But then verse 7 also gives us his heart motivation. It says, in reverent fear, he constructed the ark. You know, Noah lived in a culture and there were a lot of reasons to be afraid. I mean, there were a lot of reasons to be afraid. There were evil, wicked, and violent people all around him. But when the word fear is used in reference to Noah, isn't it interesting that it's not used about his fear of men? How is it used in Noah's life? It's used about his fear of God. His holy fear, his reverent fear of God. How does one live righteously before God in a wicked world? You fear God more than you fear man. Now, I think sometimes we can be uncomfortable with this idea of fearing God. But, but Noah's fear before God wasn't a person cowering before God saying, don't hurt me. It wasn't someone coming for God, frightened by him. The actual Greek word here, in Hebrews eleven seven, that we get the phrase reverent fear from, literally means to be in awe of. To have reverence towards someone is to have just a deep respect them, to, to just honor them, to admire them, to, to, to lift them up. Noah acknowledged God as the one true God. It wasn't just a heady acknowledgement. It wasn't just kind of Sunday school facts in his mind. It was acknowledgement that transformed his life and it convicted how he lived. For Noah, since God is God, since he is creator, since God is the author of all things, and because all things belong to God, Noah chose to live according to the ways of God. He chose to establish his morals and his values and his integrity, not based on the wisdom of men or simply the pattern of his culture, but on the wisdom and the character of God. Noah knew that God was creator and he was creation. Noah knew God was holy and he was not. I believe it is this view of God God that caused Noah to do what is described of him back in Genesis 6, 9. After it says that he was righteous and blameless, it gives us this great description of, of Noah's relationship with God. It says he walked with God. That in a wicked generation, he said, I choose God. I choose his way. Whether his way leads me to death or longevity, whether it leads me to ridicule or admiration, I choose God. That is who I choose to have fellowship with. That is choose who I choose to have intimacy with. I choose him. If you want to define my life, define it as a man who knows God, who had companionship with God, who had a friendship with God. And so God, in his relationship with Noah, one who walked with God, God tells Noah some things. He says, Noah, I am grieved by the wickedness of this world. Noah didn't have to say, well, what wickedness are you talking about, God? 
no one knew the wickedness. I'm grieved by the wickedness of this world to, to the point that I am going to destroy all living things. And so, Noah, I want you to commit your time. I want you to commit your resources. I, I, I want you to commit your life to build an ark. This giant boat, it's never been built before. I want you to build this. And I am going to continue humanity through you and your sons. It's an unbelievable request. To, the, 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 uh, to our ears, it probably just seems so, like it's, it's crazy. And yet when we get to verse 22, knowing Noah as we now know him, his response is so natural. In fact, his response is a foregone conclusion. Verse 22 says, Noah did this. Or we could simply say, Noah said, okay. Noah obeyed. And it says he did all that God commanded him. See, Noah looked at the options in his generation. And he said, I choose God. I'm walking with you. Through life, through death, through pain, through comfort, I'm walking with you. You know, when we think about Noah, we certainly think about an ark. We certainly think about a flood. But when we think about Noah, I hope that we will think about a man who stood alone in a generation that had long abandoned God. He stood alone in a generation that was wicked and evil and was just giving themselves to whatever lust and desires they had, living however they wanted to live. When we think of Noah, hope will think of a man who lived in that generation and said, I choose God. And God, when you say go, I will go. When you say stop, I will stop. When you say build an ark, I will say, let's get going. And by faith, Noah, out of a holy awe, a reverent awe that God is God, built an ark. You know, one of the things that, uh, for the reason of Genesis 6, is to give us an example of how you and I can live in a wicked and depraved generation. Hebrews tells us that, that one of the reasons for, that we're given the life of Noah is he's an example to us. In fact, Hebrews 11 gives us the example of, of by faith, all these men and women who walked by faith. And then we come to Hebrews 12, and we're given these wonderful words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those witnesses of the Old Testament, men and women who walked by faith in a generation that said, what are you doing? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin clings so closely and let us run with God. I'm inserting that myself. Let us run with God with, per with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. May we be that type of man, that type of woman that stands in the culture and says there is no God and we say I choose God because he is creator, he is author of all things. He is good and he's merciful and he is gracious. And he and he alone I will walk with by faith. I want to invite the worship team to come forward. We're going to close our time by participating in communion together. And as we do, I want us to remember what, in the same way that, that Noah was responding to a God who was good and gracious and merciful, we, we are responding to that same God, but we have a fuller picture than Noah had, is we have a God who sent his own son Jesus into a wicked world to die for us. That while we were still sinners, we just heard Christ died for us, and our response is to give our lives fully and completely to him. As we turn from our sin, we place our hope in Christ as the only one who can forgive our sins and give us salvation. And so when we gather in a time like this, as we enter into communion, we, we get to respond to him and say, God, I choose you 
Today, once again, I choose you. Today, once again, I choose to lay down my life and, and I will take up my cross and I will follow your son. And, and, and I will walk by faith in a generation and in a culture that does not know you, but I will walk boldly in that for you and for your glory. May that be true of us.